okay, so yeah, I know the first slide itself says something like nightmares and all, talking, starting from a negative note. I don't want to, but that is what it is. I will get into the topic as well. But uh, really, like you know, uh, Kunal, it was a really great talk by the way. Shout out to him once again. Uh, I just really loved it. Uh, I can empathize with that because I have faced those issues and you know, it's really good. Saving a lot of dev developer time. Okay. Uh, so in okay in today's talk, in this today's topic, I would like to uh, focus more towards developer experience and. Uh, would like to share with you guys how it affects our life, the timelines of the project, and it also affects our mental peace a lot. So, uh, so let me just start off with sharing a couple of experiences in terms of nightmares. Okay, those are nothing but the project nightmares that you have. Uh, the first one is an unformatted code. Okay, this is a very trivial one, but it happens to be uh, like, you know, if you have a large organization and you have more than 200 or 300 developers working on a uh, working on a code base and it's not unformatted, you get a Christmas tree on your VS code. Okay, all red squiggly lines and you're doomed, you know. And just imagine if you have a client, you are working for a client, you have a VM, just imagine how slow it is, you know, because you are connecting over the network and all those Citrix and all those things happens with you, okay? That's one dreadful experience, okay? Another thing that is, this gets pushed to the remote. <laughs> now, the, now the fun part begins, okay? It's up to you that you have that unformatted code with you, okay? Now what happens is you push it onto remote and now everyone will have it once you take the pull. Okay. Okay. Let me share another thing. Uh, there are certain aspects that people <laughs> try to do. This is nothing but the no verify flag that they try to put uh, whenever they are trying to do commit. Actually, there is certain thing towards it. This flag is used for you know. Uh, to bypass certain functions that get executed whenever a commit happens. And those are just the sanity checks uh, that have been brought by the developers and the maintainers of the project and which are required essential before you push any code to it. Okay. So now people try to do that this as well. I have like I have seen it live people good and you know it's horrible. Okay. <laughs> and why people do this? just so that to avoid the error that comes up after this message or you know you don't have time to you know uh, fix that uh, warnings that are coming up right so that's one thing okay let me yeah another thing force merging PRs without test or without checks happening and you know yeah yeah, yeah just push it it's just a production defect that is happening and it's uh, like you know we cannot wait more on this okay so people try to do this as well so these are nightmares uh, another one is you like uh, this is a pretty new mistake i would say because people try to add uh, extra dependencies to the use effect which are not required but they say that it renders their component correctly so actually that shouldn't be the case because then later on people try to put those, you know, disable the ESLint feature itself altogether on the dependency array and then, you know, you're good to go <laughs> and your component starts to work. Yeah, but these are the nightmares which comes at a price, not now, but it will come later. Slowly it creeps out after four months, six months as your team grows, it burst into such a big bubble that uh, uh, that you cannot manage it and you have to do maybe a refactor or maybe you have to create an entire separate ticket altogether to you know <laughs> do these uh, small uh, logistic things of cleaning up the code base and all those stuff. You are wasting your time on this right and I would I have personally uh, you know uh, saw this because 
if just uh, imagine you have a module federated application where uh, like multiple compo like you know multiple react apps are connected to a main app and just imagine the problems that you will face during that scenario so that is a big nightmare that comes in okay it affects the development you know it affects the speed that's the first part because if a simple save is taking like you know 5 to 10 minutes just to save the code and to regenerate the build that you have developed that's one bad experience that you have it affects the readability as well having the christmas tree in your vps code is not a good thing and it obviously you know hinders your experience you know it breaks your link of debugging whenever you are trying to do it right so that's one aspect and overall this affects the developer experience which in my case uh, like uh, which i feel is so important because if we don't uh, think about these aspects we will be stuck at the same problem all the time again and again we are trying to solve the same problem see you have a bug with you but before that you need to do all these things format the code you know remove those uh, squiggly error lines and all those you know trivial stuff that you have to do suppose you it went like half a day for you went into that aspect just imagine the waste of time that you deal with so that's where uh, I am trying to like my talk focuses on this particular aspect like we are trying to see what are the some of the bulletproof configurations for any project or a react based project that you know which are sensible and you know which can be applied as a good practices as well into the project so yeah uh, let's get started so yeah i'm uh, so i've been introduced as well but yeah this is me i'm a front -end, senior front end engineer at publicis sapien and uh, it's been more than 6 years now i'm doing this i am a book enthusiast i love to solve complex ui problems and try to unravel them you can and i'm also volunteering at js lovers pune chapter uh, where we organize meetups and all this stuff so yeah i have to that plug again yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah you can reach out to me on twitter uh, x.com linkedin and github okay so let's get started so uh, this is just a baseline what I feel like to get a good developer or a basic developer nice experience I think these th three things are the baseline standards that I feel this is very opinionated thought but every project has you know every like you know set of standards what I feel these are the basic ones like ESN should be there git hook should be there and certain github actions ci and all those stuff should be there those all three are linked but we will take a look one by one what they are okay so yeah this is nothing but a good ux a ds right okay so uh, let us start by understanding what eslint is okay so eslint is nothing but a tool that helps you to improve like uh, it helps you to find bugs into your code and also helps you to fix those issues as well uh, like ESLint uh, is a configuration based rule based tool that helps you to uh, do all that stuff and uh, you can uh, use it like most of the text editors have them integrated you can use your own configuration files to set it up or you can also set it up on your uh, pipelines as well, GitHub Actions and so on and so forth. But internally, how like this is how the ESLint works. Like ESLint architecture itself is a uh, pretty complex one. I won't go into that details. But uh, ESLint has the CLI engine package. Like there are a lot many five to seven to eight packages are there inside of it cli engine is one of them it takes the source code it takes your uh, configuration files as well and um, and it goes through this linter class that they have and then it tries to run all of those rules and configurations that you have set in your config file and that verification happens and then if you have any auto fixable actions the linter 
let, then you will get a linted code. Like you do, right? When you uh, do control S on VS code, all of the formatting comes in and all. That's how it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, like that's the main uh, scene that happens behind it. Okay. So now uh, like we know what ESLint would help us to do. Let us look at the common problems that it will help us to solve. The first common problem that I see, it's a pretty basic one, the unused variables. Uh, it's a simple thing, but uh, yeah, certain projects don't even have these. I have seen that as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, I think these are a bit of a, like, you know, less highlighted, the starting ones. I hope you guys are able to see, right? Less highlighted ones. Those indicate that they are unused in VS Code, right? But if you try to, you know, uh, these are nothing but those. No squiggly lines, nothing. There is no indication whatsoever. Even the, uh, even during uh, the builds that happen on uh, on your CI, won't fail for you because it's just going to pass on. And when some person tries to see this code, you see a component that is bloated with unused variables altogether. People are not even bothered to, you know, change it altogether. And that would definitely get missed. <laughs> but in ESLint, there are certain rules that you can set up in their configuration files as well. So one of the, like, uh, don't worry, I will be going into this demo as well of how you can create your own flat config file where you can uh, define your set of rules and what should its severity be. We will look at all those rules as well. Uh, yeah, so we have this no unused uh, vars variable that comes to our rescue. So it's basically, it will try to, you know, put those error squiggly lines over there, as you see. And it will help you to fail the build as well. You can define it severity, it's up to you. You can set it as a warning, so build will pass on. But you can do that as well. Uh, that's one. Next, uh, I just hate that experience when you have console.logs. Okay, in your console, in your browser, it bloats up. I know you guys have loggers that have been set up during your Redux Saga implementation, it helps. But there are certain cases where people try to just console log to just check what the output is going to be. Maybe you can use a better tool called as debugger in Chrome that will help you to do that. <laughs> but just don't use console.logs. So one of the scenario is like, yeah, I, just as I said, you have unnecessary bloating that happens. I know I have just pasted a code over there and showing those logs, but that really happens. And uh, this can also lead to leaking your user's data altogether. This can happen, okay? So, normal user won't be even bothered of going into that console dot and, you know, console, uh, like, you know, console uh, terminal and trying to see what the data is. But being us as a developer, or even if I go on to any nice site, now, I will try to go, in, go to its console terminal and try to see what they are trying to do and what is printing out. I would definitely see the personal data if this happens. Okay. So to avoid this, people try to do uh, like people try to uh, have a couple of redaction tools as well, or in code reviews as well uh, that gets pointed out. Even there are certain extensions uh, or you know companies such as CodeRabbit.ai that does automatic code reviews and it will also uh, point out that there is one console statement. But not every startup would afford maybe the pricing of it or so on. Next is some wrapper function. So based on, and this wrapper function needs to be used everywhere instead of a console statement. So that will run on, based on a production environment altogether. But there is still margin of error. A human error still can happen, right? So the next, again, a simple ES lint rule can help you to do that simply by you know setting the no consoles rule to be uh, you know uh, to be error failing the builds and also having the squiggly lines for you okay uh, the next problem that i have is duplicated and sorted imports uh, 
Okay, so I'm not sure if any of you guys have experienced this, but uh, if you have a large code base and if you have a very big file, you have a lot many imports with you, right? They are like I have this practice of seeing those imports in an alphabetical manner, okay, <laughs> all the time. And from A to B, I like to see this. And the practice that I have is first uh, the import should be from package, and the last ones. Uh, at, at the bottom should be related to some relative imports like functions and all that's the practice but that this happens you know <laughs> this dreadful thing happens and you know you, like you have these unhighlighted things that you are seeing over there which are like, not used in your component anymore right it unnecessarily bloats your component altogether all the time this happens so there is another a plugin for this as well as there is a rule for uh, in ESRIN that will help you to manage this as well. This is the manual horror that you have to do, you know. See, are you seeing this GIF or should I zoom in a bit? See, you are doing this manually, moving those things one at a time. Then. So now you have it, right? All of it. <laughs> Again, I'm trying to, you know, set it after use effect, comma use state, which I feel is not a great thing to do. Taking like this GIF is long, so let me go to the next slide. A simple, simple uh, import sort plugin and this no duplicate imports rule can fix this issue. Let me show you how. Let me zoom in a bit and then show you the GIF. Since this is an auto fixable rule as well as plugin, just clicking, like just saving the file does all the magic for you. Yeah, it hasn't imported, like, you know, remove the duplicates, like duplicate imports, as in, like, if you see the React DOM line, right, it has more than four, uh, yeah, three React router DOM lines. So there is, there isn't an auto fixable thing for it. But yeah, there are communities working to do that as well to remove and to place the import in just one line. Okay. Uh, yeah, just let me go to the next one. Yeah, now we have GitHub, uh, Git, uh, like uh, Git hooks. Like we learn about ES10. Now let's start with Git hooks as well. So, Git hooks are, uh, like hooks are nothing but uh, programs that get executed whenever you try to perform specific actions in a git operation. These hooks programs are generally placed in a, a dot hooks folder of a dot git folder inside of that. So uh, let me show you what this thing would do. It's again a very opinionated thing. People try to say, hey, yeah, you can easily bypass this, there's no verify flag that we saw earlier. Uh, but yeah, it would save us a lot of time on CI as well. Let me uh, show you, like we know what git hooks are. Uh, yeah, so that's what I was saying. So hooks program are basically placed in git dot git slash hooks folder and they get executed based on, you know, in which uh, operation that you want. For example, uh, if you want to run a certain action, like if you want to run a prettier on all the stage files that are there, just whenever the commit happens, so you can place your hook script, uh, hook scripts inside a pre-commit hook. So before any commit happens, you can just place it over there, and you know, all the things will happen for you. So uh, that's one part. And uh, yeah, I shamelessly copied this image from Atlassian's blog <laughs> because it was really <laughs> like you know a really nice blog that explains this concept. So. Uh, yeah, so there are a uh, couple of steps that any git, like you know, git action does. A simple commit message also has these steps, like staging the changes, then committing the changes, then entering the commit message. You can, and there comes our pre-commit notification as well over here, like the first purple dot, which is where our pre-commit hook will get executed. Uh, but yeah. I will go into the details of installing these hooks and everything in the demo. 
but let me uh, let me showcase couple of yeah i will yeah so git hooks you can directly place it in your uh, project or you can use some github managers or libraries as well out there such as husky and pre commit and there are a lot many out there that will help you to you know use your pre commit hooks like you know like not pre commit hooks github git hooks it will help you to manage them i am using husky in our demo but you can use any that you like so let us first understand what uh, like how git hooks will help us to solve first like you know the couple of problems that i uh, that we have but yeah the number one problem that i have is <laughs> secrets getting committed <laughs> just imagine the api keys you have pasted just for testing purposes <laughs> goes on to remote <laughs> that gets merged as well so just imagine the horror that you will face you know it just this is you and you have this utility fetch data you are using that secret over there in the fetch call just to, you know make an api call and just to test it out right and then at night you remember oh <laughs> the horror <laughs> what have we done <laughs> right we have just pushed an api key which was to related to just our organization and do we are there we are at this stage so what solution do, do we have <laughs> one solution would be to reverse the commit and everything but still that uh history would be there with you in the git history and get logs all together right that's a very dead code experience for any open source project out there okay <laughs> so to avoid that we have git hooks and git hooks inside that we can install git leaks okay this is a pretty nifty and a nice tool that uh, it's it's an open source tool it needs to be installed uh on windows and uh, mac uh like mac os as well it can get installed and uh, as you can see the git loop uh, git leaks what it will do once you i have configured this by the way in my pre commit hook okay so whenever i try to commit anything this will run the git leaks command as well for you so what it will do it will scan all the commits or you know you set a radius a blast radius to it maybe 12 or 20 commits behind uh, my pre commit hook should test those commits for any leak of api keys or any secrets out there okay i so it will try to uh, scan and if there is nothing you are good to go but if there is then this would be the output of it it pinpointed what the key was it pinpointed the line it was there the file the line number and the fingerprints and all those things and it warns you and it will not even allow you to do a git commit at that point because you are exposing an api key so that's a pretty uh, you know good thing right you can stop that person that developer itself in his development cycle only to you know not to do that but there is one you know magic wand he has called as no verify that he used at the start right <laughs> so that's one thing so there is the thing to bypass that as well uh, that is no verify but we can stop developers from doing that as well okay uh, we will talk about that soon but let's come to a problem number 2 which is no unit test before commit so unit test i feel are very important uh, obviously it brings stability to your code base it also helps to write a reliable code base as well all the time and we know we get the confidence ki ha main ship kar sakta hu abhi feature like you know all the requirements are being tested by myself in this unit test but again if you try to uh run these unit tests on maybe ci it will it will run all the test and then generate the bill uh build it unnecessary uh takes the ci's time you know ci's time is precious companies charge for that a lot okay so to avoid maybe you can save some time by just running the test which are relevant to your commit only right why to you know do all those steps on the ci and wait and uh, i have pushed my git cup like you know i have pushed my commit to the server that's it now i will chillax for 15 20 minutes you know wait for the build to happen and everything but why to waste time over there as well 
so that's why i place this uh, in git hooks as well so that only the related files uh, test would get generated and the rep uh, coverage report will get generated and if it's uh, below certain th threshold the commit itself won't happen or uh, uh, or yeah if there is an error that will warn as well if that particular commit message has taken place so there isn't any uh, like you can set up this git hook in whatever fashion that you want what i feel is like uh, the approach that i took was to uh, whenever a git commit happens right i would take all the staged files dot js staged files and uh, once those staged files are there with me uh, so okay inside the hook i will fetch all those dot uh, js files and only take their file names and append the dot test dot js to the end of it and run the related tests related to it so uh, npm or any uh, weed project that or you know create react app you have you can run a zest test with a related tests there is a flag that will help you to do that you can turn that on and you know you can run those related tests so i will show that as well that script as well in the demo but let's complete this presentation first so last we went we have github actions that uh, like you know we discussed but that will solve our main issue related to git hooks that get bypassed with no verify flags what we will do is we will also try to place those esln configurations uh, and uh, running these tests and and git leaks feature on ci as well so that like any developer who is using this flag like you know won't get bypassed by that so that's one thing uh yeah and definitely these are certain github actions that you can use and all these checks should pass so that you know you can merge them and everything uh yeah the, this is we this this is what we discussed but there are other tools and or like okay there are other tools or rules are there in eslint such as js.recommends or there are other plugins as well that will help us to provide a better experience related to react code base as well for example that uh, the first one where we saw where we were adding uh, unrelated dependency that also uh, like you know uh, gets intimidated to us via via these plugins as well so it's already like whenever you create re, uh, create a app with create react app or why so it's just pre configured for us we are not even bothered to look at it because it's such a good configuration and such a good defaults but it's worth to look at because when later on when these kind of requirement comes in you have to go through all that stuff anyway <laughs> so yeah so that's it uh, but the main thing for this talk i was inspired by was ccm js i just really love and i got to know about this from webpacks i think webpack or eslint yeah eslint's case study so ccm js hold on uh, yeah so they are like uh, they are uh, nothing but a visualization tool like it helps them to uh, visualize uh, what we see uh, geospatial coordinates and everything so just imagine their library is mission critical all the time they cannot afford to have a build failure for more than half an hour or so maybe or 3 hours or so they cannot have any like because it's so critical because life are dependent on them or even a million dollar device that is there that is working is dependent on J javascript okay so for them having these set of eslint rules has helped them so much and you can also have your own set of custom configurations as well but still that has helped them you know tackle and you know mitigate or uh, catch hold of problems 
rather than getting like those problems getting early in the later stages of their cycle. So that has helped them a lot. And for me, this their style guide was really, uh, you know, this their coding guide guideline was so inspiring because they are defining how the variable name should be, what should be their intentions, and how you should write an uh, like you know PR uh, PR descriptions and everything. It was super super useful. I would suggest if you are developing any open source project, I would suggest maybe try to you know look into this coding guideline because I find it to be really inspiring. Maybe this should be the template <laughs> for everybody. But yeah, that's that was the inspiration. Uh, but yeah, uh, let's move on to our demo. Hold on. Okay, uh, give me a second. This is a pre-commit one. Let me show you. Uh, okay, I have from the slides itself. I had this um, couple of rules that I mentioned in the slides. So the same ones I'm trying to showcase. This is a very very simple flat configuration file for ESLint, and it's uh, very simple. There are much more complicated uh, configurations out there, which are like. Maybe you can look at CCM, JS, ESNet as well. You may know the <laughs> horror that we are going to see. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, let me just comment out all the rules first to show you what the output would look like without this. Okay. Yeah. Now the Simple as that, but let's try to have like let's turn them on one by one and see how our index.js lights up as it is. Okay, so let's have yeah. So when we are enabled this no unused event we got uh, and we set it to as error. We did get a lot many errors saying that you know we have uh, uh, unused variables and the ES rule, the ES means rule that we are using over here. Okay, we can set it to warning as well if we want. If we set it to warn, nothing will happen again. It's just a warning that you say I don't know why we are not seeing the yellow squiggly squid lines that we see. So yeah, we can check that. Similar to that is no console in force and this one. You can go to their documentation and read about their getting started guide on uh, what the flat configuration is and how it helps us to dynamically change the rules as we require. Because it's a .js, like you know, it's a JavaScript file now and not a JSON file. So it has made things a lot of simpler. Uh, okay, let's talk about the pre-commit hooks that we you know, we were discussing. So. I have been using Husky as a Git hooks, uh, uh, hooks manager. Let me show what Git, uh, what that says. Uh, it 
it's a simple 2 kb package that you know uh, help you to do that it's just as simple as you know installing it with uh, yarn that's all it won't take that much of time but to initialize any commit like you know initialize any code you need to run this init command of this to start the startup with it but I actually did a fun thing uh, on this one uh, okay. so are you seeing this okay, git leaks so this is a script okay. you have a dot husky folder over here and inside that I have placed this pre hyphen commit over here so I have uh, like I did copy their example for the purpose of this uh, talk. So it checks that if Bitfix is enabled or not, and then it also checks that you know if the files are being you know, this one. Yeah, if Bitfix is installed or not, and if it is, then we run the protect command. Bitfix has this protect command which checks the existing source code for any leaks that are there in your code base. Or you can also use Bitfix detect that will check all the commit messages or you know uh, the commit history of it. So I have been using protect uh, protect over here to run it on the stage files. Next I told ChatGPT as well to you know do, do the scripting for me because I am not a good at that script. <laughs> so I told it to you know modify this script in such a way that first check that if Bitfix is installed or not into your system and if it's enabled or not. And lastly, I also told Bitfix to you know do this section for me as well. Uh, sorry, I told ChatGPT as well to do this section for me. Where you know fetch, uh, like fetch all the staged files that are there in our commit history at the moment and then run your related tests. So this is the code for that. That helps you to run the test of it. Uh, Whenever you are trying to execute uh, Let me see if I can run this. I know this session might get boring. Uh, <coughs> we are about to end, by the way. Give me a I, I have a secret. Uh, I have placed a secret over here. And okay, it's trying to run any tests as well. Okay. It did fail some test cases as <coughs> the test was failing for it. I just created a dummy test to fail it purposefully. But yeah, the script is working fine so that it can it would take those stage files as well. I think we also need to edit this script and need to tell chat GPT to you know if this particular test fails with an exit code well, I should run at least the git links, right? I should get that out. So yeah, I might need to modify that. But yeah, but that's all for my topic. Uh, so thank you very much.